Welcome. My name is Joel. I serve as one of the pastors here at Panama Baptist Church. We are so glad that you've taken the time to join us online. Say hello in the chat box if you're watching this at the live chat gathering. We'd love to know that you're there to be able to encourage you, to interact with you. If you have a prayer request, feel free to put it in the chat box and we will be honored to pray for you. A few announcements for you as we begin our time together. We've announced this the last couple of weeks. Don't forget, adult education modules are launching next weekend on January 23rd. It'll take place for six Sundays, 9.45 in the morning here at the church building. We've gone over the topics in past weeks, so I won't do that again today. But you can go to PanamaBaptist.org, go to our website, click on the Current Resources tab, and you will find more information about the classes. And also, we'll give you the option to register. We are asking that you register and sign up for these classes ahead of time. Couple of reasons for that. One, it helps us with the classroom space, so we know which class to put where, judging on the or based on the uh, size of the class that's signing up for it. Uh, also, it just lets us know is there enough interest to do this class. So please don't wait till the last minute. Please sign up to do that, and that would greatly help us out. Uh, we're in the process of updating our church directory. If you'd like to be added and you're a regular tender of PBC, you can send your information to office at PanamaBaptist.org. Send us your name, your mailing address, phone number, and email. We also like to include birthdays and anniversaries in there as well, so you can send us that information. If you're in the directory already, and the information is incorrect or out of date, maybe you've moved, something like that, uh, send us the correct information as well, and we want to be sure to get that correct for you. Uh, last thing is I'll just take the time to remind you about these Invite to Listen cards. Uh, these are business size cards that have all of the church information on them, the mailing address, phone number, website, and then also the times of our services, both of the online live chat as well as our in-person gathering. Uh, these are great tools. A lot of people are using these just as they're having conversations with their neighbors and their friends and their coworkers and want to tell them about church. They can put one of these cards in their hands. If you have run out of these or you'd like some more, feel free to stop by the church office. We can get you some more or send us a note and we'll be happy to drop some in the mail to you. All right, that's it for our announcements this morning. Let's turn it over to the praise team. How great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written, Jesus Christ, my living. So great a mercy, what heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken.
the morning that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me then came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me jesus your 
Pastor Andy here with part three in our study in the book of Mark. Somebody recently gave me this comic uh, about a supposed gathering of the animals around the baby Jesus. And then the camel says, I'll bear him gifts, a reference to the wise men, right? Bringing gifts to Jesus. And the donkey says, I'll carry him. And there's a story about that in the Bible. And, and then the fish says, I'll pay his taxes. And yeah, there's a story about that too. And the cow adds, well, I'll quench his thirst. And the dove says, well, I'll bless his baptism. And there's a story about that too. And then the, the, uh, the chicken jumps in, I'll feed him. And the sheep says, I'll, I'll warm him. And the pig says, well, I'll let him fill me with demons. And then I'll jump off a cliff and wait, 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 what, what? <laughs> There's a story about that too. It's one that we're going to look at a little bit today. We're studying the first eight chapters of the book of Mark. And as you read through those eight chapters, you'll find eight times that Jesus drove out demons. Uh, now, the, they're frequently referred to as unclean or impure spirits, but that means demons. And then, so as we work through this first half of the book of Mark, this is a topic that I would love to ignore, but really can't, because it just comes up so many times I wouldn't be doing the book justice if I ignored it. Now, I, I get it. For some of you out there who are listening, demons might sound an awful lot like Medieval superstition, you know, something that people who didn't know much, people from the Dark Ages believed in. Some of you might be wondering, oh my goodness, Pastor Andy, are you going to go weird on me? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, here's what I'm going to try to do in our time together. All right, first, I'm going to try to show you what Jesus said about the topic. And then second, I'm going to give you my best guess as to why we don't see much devil or demon activity. And then third... I'm going to try to explain something supernatural that you almost definitely experience on a very regular basis. And then fourth, answer a few basic questions that you might have. So let's start with a quick rundown of the eight instances. Chapter 1, verse 21 through 27, there's this demon there and it identified Jesus as the Holy One of God and it asked if Jesus had come to destroy them, which I thought was really interesting. Uh, the demon used this plural uh, even though there was only one demon in the man. So he understood that what Jesus was about to do could affect all of them. Well, they, uh, the demons, wanted to know if Jesus came to conquer their realm and rescue the people enslaved to them. And Jesus said he did come to destroy the devil's work. That's 1 John 3, 8. And the spirit, this demon, shook the man violently and shouted. And then the crowd was amazed at Jesus' authority, both in his teaching and his power over the spirits. Chapter 1, verses 32 through 34 just simply tell us that Jesus drove out many demons that night and he didn't permit the spirits to speak because they knew that he was Messiah. You find that in Luke 4, 41. And his muzzling them shows that his authority and his power, but it also allows his own words and his deeds to communicate who and what the Messiah is. Chapter 1, verse 39 says that he went from town to town preaching and casting out demons. Chapter 3, verses 11 and 12, said that whenever the impure spirits saw him, they fell down before him in fear and in submission because they recognized him. And unless Jesus muzzled them, they couldn't help but address him as the Son of God. That title that we found out all the way back in Mark 1.1. 1, 1. Chapter 5 Verses 1 to 20 tell us of another demon possession story. This time it's a, a demon possessed man living in the cemetery. And he lived in torment and he did self harm. The demon possessed man met Jesus on his knees and the demon addressed Jesus as the Son of the Most High God. And he begged Jesus not to torment them. The demons were given permission as they were leaving the man to enter the pigs and they immediately caused the pigs to commit suicide by running off a cliff. Chapter 6, verse 7, and verse 13 tell the story when Jesus sent out his 12 disciples in pairs on a mission trip. And he told them to preach, and he told them what to preach. And he gave them authority over any demons they might encounter along the way. And while on that trip, they preached and they exercised demons. And then in chapter 7, we have yet another story. And in this one, Jesus cast out a, a demon out of a young girl. That's chapter 7, verses 24 to 30. So as you put all that together, 
I made some observations. Number one, uh, demons are real. They're not figurative. They're not figments of our imagination or medieval uh, uh, superstition. They are real. Second, they are obedient to the prince of demons. We commonly call him the devil or Satan. Third, as you look at those stories, one of the things that jumps out is this, that they are abusive and parasitic. They, yeah, they terrorize their hosts and they harm their hosts. And you see that as you look at the stories. Uh, for they are powerful. They are physically strong. They're able to take over the host's functions and make the host do some pretty dramatic things physically. Uh, fifth, demons are resistant to leaving their hosts. As, in fact, humans seem to be incapable of exercising them on their own. And that's why so many of the people came to Jesus. They had friends or family members that had demons in them, and they, despite everything they had tried, were unable to kick the demons out of the host. This next part is where it gets good. Demons are doomed. Their kingdom will be totally destroyed, and they will experience punishment individually for eternity. The Bible teaches that clearly. And then finally, demons are no match for Jesus. Not one successfully resisted a single order from Jesus, and every single one bowed in fear and in submission. There's one more passage in Mark about Jesus and demons, and this is the one that we're going to focus on today. And it's found in Mark chapter 3. So if you've got a Bible, you can join me. I'm in verse 20. Mark 3.20, Jesus entered a house and the crowd gathered again so they were not even able to eat. And when his family heard this, they set out to restrain him because they said, he's out of his mind. Verse 22, the scribes have a different explanation. The scribes who had come down from Jerusalem said, he's possessed by Beelzebul. Now Beelzebul was the name that they gave to the prince of demons, what we've called Satan or uh, the devil, right? So they said, Jesus is acting the way he's acting because he's possessed by a demon, the prince of demons even. And, verse 22 continues, he drives out demons by the ruler of demons. So as we look at these three verses together, we see a couple things. His family thought that Jesus had gone insane. He was so busy with people that he didn't worry about eating and they were worried about him. And so they were going to restrain him and take him home. The Jewish religious leaders accused Jesus of being demon-possessed and of working with Satan. They said that he casts out demons, yeah, but he's doing that in collusion with Satan. Like, it's all a big trick, folks. That's what they're saying. Satan is enabling him to cast out these demons. What is clear is this. Both groups rejected Jesus' identity and his authority, just like we talked about last week. So these are big charges, right? Jesus, you are... You are possessed by a devil, and you're working with the devil. Well, Jesus answered the charges with parables. Mark 3, verse 23. So he summoned them and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand but is surely finished, right? So Jesus is saying, listen, if Satan is using Satan's power to cast out demons, then Satan is working against himself. And that would lead to Satan's destruction. And as evidence of the logic, Jesus gave these two examples, a divided kingdom and a divided family. Since Satan would never be crazy enough to attack himself, and Jesus is clearly attacking the demonic world, Jesus and Satan can't be working together. So it's not collusion. It's not a civil war. Jesus, you know, wants to usurp Satan's authority. It's not that. It's not a civil war within the satanic kingdom. So there's got to be something else. And what that something else is, is shown clearly in verse 27. I love this verse. Jesus said, but no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man. Then he can plunder his house. So in verse 27, we get the parable of the strong man. So let's identify what all the parts of the parable stand for. The strong man is Satan. The strong man's house is this world. Um, now, 
It's more than that, right? Does Satan's realm include sin and sickness and demon possession and death? Well, well, yeah. But in this case, the house is the world. The strong man's possessions are people who are owned and enslaved by Satan. And the plunderer, the one who's doing the action, right? Tying up the strong man and then plundering the house, that's Jesus. So this is not collusion. It's not a civil war. It is an all-out attack by the kingdom of God on the kingdom of, of the devil, right? Jesus came to plunder Satan's kingdom. I love that. Jesus came to plunder Satan's kingdom. And he started by tying up the strong man, right? What Jesus is doing through his exorcisms is the equivalent of entering Satan's realm of power and control, right? Coming right to his turf and then tying him up and stealing his stuff. Now for you and me, who are followers of Jesus Christ. Man, it feels so good to know that we have been so heroically rescued. We have been plundered uh, from Satan's kingdom. That is awesome. I love thinking about that. Now, as I talk about these few verses, you, you may have some questions. I wrote down three of them that I, I want to try to answer in our remaining minutes together. The first is, does Jesus' plundering of Satan's kingdom mean that we don't have to worry about Satan or demons anymore? I mean, if Jesus came to plunder and he did it, does that mean we don't, we've got nothing to worry about? It, it, no more demons, no more devil? Is that what that means? Well, a couple answers to that. First, I would say it definitely means that Satan and demons cannot get Jesus' followers in their grasp. Uh, 1 John chapter 5, verses 18 to 20. Let me just read that. It says, We know that everyone who has been born of God does not sin, but the one who is born of God keeps him, and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are of God, and the whole world is under the sway of the evil one. And we know that the, the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know the true one. We are in the true one, that is, in His Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God, and the eternal life. Now, there's a lot packed in that verse, or set of verses, actually. And I also want to acknowledge that this is a very difficult text to translate from the original Greek. Uh, people who are way smarter than me have really had to work hard on this and struggle and sometimes come to slightly different uh, translations of this verse. But based upon what the Bible clearly does teach about Jesus and what John writes earlier in 1 John and this set of verses together, I believe this is what it's saying. Everyone born of God, that is born again believers, Jesus followers, doesn't sin, John says. That, and what he means by doesn't sin is continue to sin or become an antichrist. Doesn't sin because the one who's born of God, that's Jesus this time, he's the one that's born of God, protects him. So everyone born of God, that's us, doesn't sin because the one who is born of God, that's Jesus, protects us. Satan can't get them in his grasp. That's the literal translation of that word touch that we read. Satan can't get them in his grasp even though the whole world is under his sway. Satan can't jeopardize our salvation or our status with God. And just as Jesus protected his disciples and didn't lose any of them except for the one that was destined for betrayal, Judas, right? He protects us. That's John 17, verse 12. We can be certain that we are God's children and that we know the truth. So Satan can't get us in his grasp. But I believe the Bible does teach that he can harm us, at least in a couple of different ways. And the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray shows us that. So let's take a quick look at that, what some people call the Lord's Prayer. Matthew 6, verses 9 to 13. Jesus said, Therefore, you should pray like this. Our Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Now look at verse 13. And don't bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Uh, that first half of verse 13, don't bring us into temptation, is like, Jesus, when you test us, when you test our faith to see if it's real and genuine, don't let that test flip over from being a test to pass to become a temptation to fail. Don't, don't let us fall into temptation, Jesus. 
And so in this prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, we're seeing that we are encouraged to pray for protection against falling into sin. And Satan and his demons could certainly tempt us to sin, right? And sin is extremely harmful. And so God says, hey, pray like this. Pray for protection against falling into sin. But he also said, pray for deliverance from the evil one. Well, how might the evil one, that being the devil or his minions, the, the demons, how, how may they try to harm us in, in such a way that we would need deliverance or protection against that? Well, we want protection against his schemes. The devil and his minions have some plans for getting us to fall into sin. And we also want protection against the traps and slander of evil men who are controlled by Satan or his demons. And, and there are probably more. But this much is clear. We, we want to be alert and we want to pray for protection. 1 John 5.8 says this, Be sober-minded. Be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for anyone he can devour. Question two. If Satan's kingdom is real then why don't we see or sense any of this? I think that's a fair question. Let me just throw out a few possible answers to it. Answer one, we tend to see what we're looking for, and we tend to not see what we don't look for or what we think isn't there or couldn't be seen. As evidence of that, think about this. There are some cultures that are kind of wired to look for supernatural explanations for things, and in those cultures, they see demonic activity, and that kind of stuff. Our culture, on the other hand, doubts the existence of the supernatural. We, when we see something that's hard to explain, we tend to look for a scientific explanation. We almost tend to believe like we're prejudiced against the supernatural. So it's not surprising to me, uh, just from that standpoint, if we don't you know, uh, see much of demonic activity or this supernatural world. And that leads into what I think probably is the best explanation, uh, which is this. I think Satan prefers to operate under the radar because it's generally more effective for him. It, I think if we saw him, if we recognize, oh, wait, that is the devil, we might be on our guard more. Uh, but because we don't see it and we don't recognize it, we're not on the alert. And, uh, and I think that's just more effective for him. But while I say that he's operating under the radar, I, I don't think for a minute that means that we're not experiencing his schemes all the time. Let, let me test this with you, if you would. I'm going to share with you what I believe are the devil's primary schemes. This comes from a kind of a combination of my observations and the scriptures. I'm going to kind of put all that together. So uh, this is what I'll share with you, what I think are the devil's primary schemes. What I want you to do is consider, and you tell me if this matches your experience, okay? Because my, my thesis is this, while the devil's studying under the radar, we are experiencing a scheme. So here they go. Uh, what are the devil's primary schemes against Christians, Jesus followers? Well, I, I think there are four of them. The first is isolation. One of the things that I see all, all, over and over again, and I think Scripture teaches too, is that when Satan wants to try to get one of us sidetracked and hurt us and, and get us caught up in something that we ought not to be in. He tries to get us separated from the Christian community, isolated from other people. And, and he does that a whole lot of ways. Shame is a, one of the big ones. But he tries to get us separated from people who will speak the truth to us. The second thing that he does is temptation. He tempts us to sin by, by getting us to ignore the long-term repercussions and consequences of some particular temptation and just highlighting the short-term pleasure, gain, or whatever. Uh, and so he tries to tempt us. And then as soon as we fall into that temptation, when we give into it, then he hits us with the third one, which is accusation. He looks at us and says, you did that again. You're so bad. You're so evil. No one would ever love you if anybody knew about this and people knew what you're really like and, right, and on and on, right? So temptation. But then as soon as you give in, he accuses you uh, of the very thing that he tempted you to do. And then the fourth scheme that I see him using against Jesus' followers all the time is lies. Lies. He tells them lies about themselves, lies about their past, lies about their potential, lies about their future, lies about God, lies, lies, lies that keep us held down and in bondage. What about for non-Christians? Well, for non-Christians, it's a little different, I think. I think his first technique or primary scheme might be almost like a matrix-style ignorance. You know, keep us 
caught up in thinking that everything we see is all that there is. Like ignorance of the supernatural realm, ignorance of eternity. That's why I say it's kind of like a matrix style, style ignorance. We're just going through life and thinking that this is it. This is all there is and this is all there is to reality when that's really not the case. A second big scheme that Satan uses with non-Christians especially is addiction. And I've got some theories on that as to why that's the case. But... Um, it's probably this. Um, Satan knows that you and I are created in the image of God, and one of the big parts of that is we have the ability to choose. And so one of the first things I see that he tends to go after with people is to try to get them locked into something that makes it feel like they can't make choices anymore. Like, they're, like they can't get their way out of this. They, that ability to choose is gone. So addiction is a huge one. And then number three, it goes right along with another way that people get caught into bondage is lies, right? If you're not addicted to something, if you just believe something that's not true, you'll still be held or locked into a cycle. And then fourth, primary scheme against non-Christians is pride. Pride. He loves to get them thinking like, there's no way I'm one of these people. There's no way I am under the control or in the grasp of the devil. There's no way this is true. I'm too smart for that, and I make my own choices, and I don't believe in fate, and I don't believe in destiny, and I don't believe in, because I make my own way. And those are all pride statements, and I really think that's one of the ways that Satan uses to, to hold on to people. So, so does that match your experience? For those of you who are Jesus followers, you, have, have you noticed that tug to isolate you from other people so you're not open or with them or with them uh, in good community? Have you, have you noticed that temptation, accusation cycle and the lies? Is, is, is that your experience? For those who, who say, well, I'm not a Jesus follower yet, did, did it fit? Does that match your experience? Uh, I, 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 I bet it does. Question number three, what? People belong to Satan? Really? Uh, Pastor Andy, you, you really think that people belong to Satan? Are you saying that everyone or just demon-possessed people belong to Satan? Or, or something like, wait, pa Pastor Andy, are, are you saying I belong or used to belong to Satan? Uh, did, did you say that? I'm glad you asked that question. I, I'm not sure that the Bible clearly addresses the issue of ownership of people. But the Bible clearly teaches that the devil controls the basic belief, value, culture systems of the world. And, and through those, he has everyone except Jesus' followers under his sway or under his control. You saw that in the passage we read in 1 John, where it says the whole world is under his sway. And when I say they're under his control, I, I don't mean that they're like puppets, that every single thing that a, a non-Christian a non-Jesus follower does was like the devil made him do it. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that he has this pervasive control over the world in which we swim. And because he controls so much of that, he has basic control over the directions that we go, the values that we have, the, the beliefs, the explanations that we tend to adopt, those kinds of things. And so therefore, I would say it this way. I'm not sure that the Bible talks about ownership of people, but I do believe the Bible says that if we're not a Jesus follower, we're basically in the grasp of the evil one. He's got us in one way or another under his control or under his sway or under his influence and perhaps under his dominion. And as I just pointed out a minute ago, I think he uses human pride to keep people from acknowledging that truth because we want to, we want to believe that we're the masters of all of our own fate and the kings of, all of our own kingdom. And I, I think he uses human pride to help keep people from acknowledging this truth. All right. This probably provokes lots of questions many of which deserve careful consideration. However, I don't want to get distracted from the main points. Here they are, three main points. Number one, this is a sermon about Jesus, not demons. 
I, I've talked about demons. I've talked about the devil quite a bit. But this, I want to be a sermon about Jesus. I, I want Jesus to be the most impressive, the most prominent thing in our minds at the end of our time together because Jesus is the powerful plunderer and he is the heroic rescuer. So at the end, let's make this sermon about Jesus, not demons, all right? Number two, the critical question is, do I belong to Jesus or am I in the grasp of the devil in some way? Th that's an important question to answer. Destiny is at stake there. It, and so I call it a critical question. Do I belong to Jesus or am I in the grasp of the devil? Am I still under his sway because I haven't had the truth revealed to me and I haven't been set free from my own sin and the consequences of that? And then number three, the wise follower will pray what Jesus taught us to pray because there is real danger out there. And so Jesus taught us how to protect ourselves by praying. And so the wise Jesus follower will pray what Jesus taught us to pray. Thank you for hanging with me to the end. This was a tough talk for me to prepare and to give. Perhaps it was a tough talk for you to hear. I want you to know I'm praying for you as you think through the things that we talked about today. And I'm looking forward to continuing on with you in our study in the first half of the book of Mark. I look forward to seeing you in part four. Thanks, Pastor Andy, for that challenge to us. Uh, our benediction as we close for the week is coming from 2 John verse 3. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us. From God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Father's Son, in truth and love. Thanks for being with us this week. If we can help in any way, whether through prayer or helping meet some tangible needs, or maybe you just need someone to talk to, don't hesitate to reach out to us here at the church office. God bless you. Praying for you this week. We'll see you next time.